My dad's family's uh, from Liverpool, so everything I knew growing up was born and bred into being a Red. I was in the Sweet 16 match of the NCAA tournament for my senior year in college, and my agent that I'm with now was like, here are the teams that are interested, and he asked me what I wanted. And I had said like a bunch of English teams that I thought I would be a good fit in, and that was realistic for my level of play. Liverpool wasn't on that list. I thought that was like way to my reach. I thought that was a place where I end my career at the peak of my playing performance, like where I want to be. And when he put my name out to Liverpool just because he thought they don't be silly, they came back with heavy interest. And when I had that contract within, I think, three weeks of communicating with them, um, and I was on a plane at the end of January heading over, it was, it was so surreal. Come on, Riley, can she save the day for Liverpool? We've already had two penalty misses in this game. Pennock oh. saved! Goalkeeper. I was probably starting to step into the role of taking over the number one position at Liverpool. I was performing really well in training. Um, had a few matches under my belt that I really put a name for myself. And of course, saving a pen against Villa is always something to celebrate. Um, I've kind of been known to do that. So to be on such a high and ready to take on the next level of my career. The boy Holoka against Riley Foster. Great save! Riley Foster does it again. Everything was coming to fruition, all that hard work, that sacrifice to be on top of the world and finally get my feet set into the ground, establish myself from the team and take over was uh, exciting, to say the least. I'd never really have taken time for myself in my career. I always was like my off time, international breaks, but I wasn't with the national team, we're just set on getting better. So I do extra training, be in the gym and for once, I literally was like, you know, I, I need to have a break. I was feeling a bit overwhelmed. Um, obviously, we had a really successful game, but just leading up to that, there was a lot of different things going on. I just needed a break, and uh, I got my break, <laughs> a really long one. I took a trip to Finland to go see my, I guess you can call him partner at the time. We were merging onto the highway. Um, it was a two-lane highway and the weather had turned a bit. And I remember as we were merging on, there was a car in front of us and it was going the speed limit and we overtook the person. And as we overtook them and accelerated in pace, I believe from what I understand is what we hit ice and hydroplane and we lost control of the car. So spinning, in the motorway, just having a great time. And eventually the car went airborne and flipped, spun around. The car finished rolling after 400 meters and I was found 30 meters away from the car. So I can't tell you exactly when I was ejected. Um, I don't know when my seatbelt failed or was disembarked, but I do know that I most likely covered some big distance. I was found in the, in the field between the two sides of the highway, so. There's just a massive grass median, I guess, and there was me freezing, screaming. Um, and my friend was consoling me, but I couldn't move my legs very well. I was not in a happy place. <laughs> Waking up in the ICU later, and I remember a doctor being at the end of my bed talking to me. I finally was able to realize like I broke my neck. Um, I broke my back, I, I, bro <laughs> I broke everything. And for them to say like, you need emergency surgery, and me say no was kind of one of those moments where like, what am I doing? But I just didn't feel like surgery was needed. Like I had no idea what they were gonna do. And that's when I was like, yeah, something's not right here. <laughs> Although my neck was broken, and as was my back and every other injury possible, the amount that my body healed miraculously in three days time in ICU was crazy. And the rest of it was then moved into like general care as well. And after that, they were like, yeah, you can go um, get on the plane and that was it. So my dad booked a first class ticket for us and I flew with a broken neck. My cousin was, who flew out to Finland with my dad as well. We were taking off and landing and my cousin would hold my shoulders to the chair. So she would unstrap herself in the airplane, sit on the floor, hold my shoulders. And I would hold my neck so that there was no movement when we were taking off and landing. When we landed in Liverpool, I got taken to my doctor from my team who has a clinic outside in Manchester. 
I get a phone call and it was, you need to rush to the hospital ASAP. I got there and I, I walked in and they're like, who are you? I was like, oh, I'm Riley Foster. Like, whoa, you are her? And I was like, yeah, like, why are you walking? It was like instant panic from all the medical team. So they had like ushered me quickly into this private bay in a wheelchair. Then they like escorted me into a chair. I was like, they're like, don't move. I was like, oh, okay, I've been moving this whole time. I'm fine, it's not that deep. And then the, the surgeon came in. I remember him saying like, so you actually have seven fractures in your neck. You have the same injury that Christopher Reeves had when he broke his neck after going off his horse. And he said, you're never gonna play again. There's no way. And I looked at my mom and I said, I'm screwed. I just started bawling my eyes out. And that was kind of the moment when I realized like, not that my life was over, but everything that I'd worked for um, was lost. It was like, I was grasping at it basically with my fingertips and couldn't even get to it. Two hours later, they did the uh, halo procedure once I arrived at the hospital. And this is gonna be like the saving grace. Like we don't think it's gonna work, but we're gonna try it because you're young, because you're an athlete. The worst case scenario, and probably the only case scenario is that you're gonna be put into uh, surgery six months on the line. So they put a little bit of local anesthetic on my skin here. Your bones don't take any of that. And they started drilling into my head with four screws. When I was in the halo and I, I had to get scanned like every month basically and I was getting my screws tightened every two weeks. So I was getting reports basically on the on the clock about what was going on and what the progress was. And for the longest time there was no progress. Um, and I kind of accepted that. I was like, okay, like they were right. But there was a meeting we had um, and it was four weeks away from basically the decision making of surgery or no. And I was like, something's gotta happen here. We can't be stagnant. And we were seeing bone growth, but it wasn't sufficient enough to promise that it was gonna be stable. Two weeks later, from D-Day essentially, we find out that every single bone in my neck has healed except for one. In my mind, I, I said I was gonna do it. Um, I didn't really announce that to the world. I didn't announce it to my family. I was just like, oh, I just wanna get healthy. But in my mind, I knew what I was going for. And I thought my body can heal seven fractures that were basically impossibly known to heal. If I'm being told I'm meant to be a tetraplegic and I'm not, something's meant to happen here and I'm meant to do something more than just heal and recover. When you start becoming an athlete again and you're out of that recovery phase and there's an identification phase of being known as the broken person for so long and trying to reestablish yourself, uh, that's really hard. I was in Liverpool for my whole recovery. It's people who I was surrounded with I became family. At my worst moments and my lowest moments, I was out there and I was supporting the team. I was working behind the scenes with the club, trying to make a difference for the women's team um, and make a difference for football in general. Leaving Liverpool and uh, losing my contract was probably one of the hardest parts of this whole process. It didn't feel fair, to say the least, and I was heartbroken by the situation and I think uh, a lot of people could agree with that. My life was literally falling upside down again. Um, I was at Celtic. On, uh, on trial for three, three weeks, basically. So uh, anyways, I failed the medical. They told me that I had microfracturing, bone bruising, and like severe bone spurs in both knees. Literally, my final opportunity, I was happy playing, so happy. I made such good connections in that squad. I was ready to take it on. I was on trial, not really a trial, but like uh, make sure you're healthy kind of thing with Blackburn Rovers. And on my way to my first session with Blackburn, I got a screenshot of an email from my agent um, and it was from Sean Gill. And basically saying like, we're heavily interested in Riley. We've already done our research. Um, we know about our injuries, but we just want to confirm all the things with you guys. We know about what's happened recently with Celtic. Um, what's the interest like? And I remember seeing that email when I, and I replied, I said, let's do it. What do I have to lose? And in goal, an amazing story. Riley Foster, the Canadian, incredible. Uh, very close to being a tetraplegic with a serious, serious car accident. She was told she would never play football again. But what a story. Incredible that she's back and walking, let alone playing professional football. And somehow appropriate that she is turning out for a club called the Phoenix because she has risen again. I don't want to live by the, the story of the biggest comeback or the comeback kid. I just want to be known as the person who defeated the odds. I think it's about the qualities that I bring now, the bravery, the resilience, the, the sacrifices and whatnot that I'll do to get to the end goal.